So welcome everybody to the um, joint CPR Graduate Institute weekly uh, seminar on papers um, publishing COVID economics. Uh, this week, we're very happy to have Greg Yarosh, who is uh, at Princeton uh, right now visiting UCL. So he didn't have to wake up so early to be with us, uh, presenting uh, his paper, uh, Internal and External Social Distancing. I got the title right. So Greg will talk for about 40 minutes and then uh, we'll have a space for Q&A. Uh, you can use the, um, the Q&A um, uh, thing to ask questions. If there is something, some urgent clarification question, just write it there and I will interrupt Greg. If not, we'll use the, we'll use the last 20 minutes for the uh, Q&A. And if you want to talk at the end, you can also raise your hand and uh, we can give you the mic. So, Greg? Um, so, thanks for putting the paper on. This is joined with uh, uh, Marianne Fabordi, who's at MIT Sloan, and, uh, and Rob Scheimer, who's at UChicago. Uh, I guess uh, this type of paper at the moment doesn't need a whole lot of a, um, of a motivating case. So, I'll pretty much just jump, uh, jump right in and, and, and tell you what we do. So, on a high level, um, we effectively integrate um, the basic epi model uh, with models of um, um, optimal control uh, of social activity. So models um, that uh, economists have long uh, been, been using uh, to think about um, individual behavior, uh, but also optimal policy in, in the face of, in the face of trade-offs. Um, I'll try and sort of con convince you that um, our, our approach offers a, a pretty simple and, 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 and tractable and, and unified um, uh, uh, way to think about both individual behavior and optimal policy uh, in, in the context of, of the pandemic. And I'll be, I'll be using it um, to, to think about one particular aspect of, of, um, of the pandemic which, um, which is a policy tool that we've been seeing sort of, um, applied across the globe, which is social distancing, in particular social distancing that, that is applied in a, in a really non-targeted um, in a really non-targeted fashion. So I won't be thinking about a sort of targeted type of quarantines and the test and trace type of policies, but rather uh, the type of sort of blunt um, policy action and also blunt sort of individual behavior um, that, that was sort of unconditional um, and yeah, that, that's what we're doing in, in depth. Um, the paper effectively has, has uh, three different parts. Uh, the first one is, is purely uh, empirical. So we'll be using the semi micro data uh, to document um, social distancing behavior, the, the extent to which social, um, social activity contracted in particular prior to any uh, official stay at home uh, lockdown uh, type mandate. And then I'll be turning to, to theory. Um, with these models, I'll, I'll try and sort of convince you that the devil is a little bit in detail. So, so I'll be uh, talking about some key, uh, key modeling assumptions. And then I'll be um, talking about how we, how we get this off the ground, basically using models that we teach in uh, uh, first year grad macro. We'll, uh, we'll be using Hamiltonians. And that will effectively boil down this, um, this, this model into a fairly simple set of um, ODEs that encode both sort of the, the epidemiological block and the behavioral block that sort of comes from, from econ tools, um, I think in a, in, a, in a fairly organized um, and, and transparent fashion. And then um, I'll put numbers onto, uh, onto the setup and show you sort of the, our key quantitative findings and talk a bit about, um, talk a bit about robustness. Now just to um, briefly, uh, preview some of our uh, some of, of, of our highlights. Uh, first in the data and you'll see that in a minute, I'll show that there was indeed a big reduction in terms of social activity across the board, across the globe, um, prior to any um, stay at home mandate, with highlighting that individuals did react on their own uh, to, um, to, to the risk of infection. Um, I'll argue that that's consistent with um, the, the equilibrium, what we call the, the laissez-faire version of our model where policy doesn't intervene. Then I'll make the case that there's indeed um, 
reason for policy intervention, there's a set of externalities. Um, and then I'll talk about sort of key features of um, optimal sort of mandated social distancing, just to preview that. The first one is, is that it's immediate. So effectively our social planner, a policymaker cracks down on social activity the moment um, that the cat is out of the bag, the moment, the moment we hear about um, uh, the, the epidemic. Um, it's, it's fairly persistent, so it's, it's a very long-lasting um, suppression of social activity, at least conditional on no vaccine or cure um, having been found. But then at the same time, and this is sort of something we really highlight, it's, 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 it's moderated in a very particular sense. Um, I put this here, I, I guess are at this point, uh, everyone knows what this stands for. Effectively, our optimal policy, but also um, to the equilibrium path, um, after peak infections effectively keeps um, the reproduction number R only, only marginally below one. So effectively what um, optimal policy does in our setting, it gets to a relatively low uh, level of peak infection and from then there on just keeps rolling over um, the stock of infected people um, on, a, on a fairly slow path towards, towards herd immunity in the hope of, um, of course, the arrival of, of, of a cure that is very distinct from a policy that sort of is geared towards uh, towards uh, uh, permanent suppression of, of of the disease. We think, um, and so I'll I'll try and give you I'll try and, uh, and give you some some intuition for why that sort of arises naturally. We think that um, these features are actually fairly consistent across the exploding body of of work that uses sort of similar tools. Um, um, to think about uh, to think about optimal policy in the context of the current outbreak, some of some of which have been on the program here in the last couple of weeks. All right, so basically, I'll I'll jump right in and show you what we do in microdata. So we have data from SafeGraph; they're publicly available to, to researchers, um, which is effectively cell phone tracking data. They're tracking a huge bunch of um, of, cell, uh, of cells in the United States. Um, the claim is that the panelist um, is uh, representative both across space and um, income. Uh, they're all, um, to, the, the data is organized around what's called points of interest. Um, so think of those as effectively businesses that cater to, to customers. Um, and the data also allow us to effectively identify the home of a cell phone owner. Um, basically, by the, 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 the provider effectively checks where the, um, where the cell phone spends the night. Um, so here's um, sort of a first figure. So let me sort of uh, tell you a bit uh, slowly what we do. We're basically at the state level measuring in the first week of March um, the average daily visits to uh, these points of interest. So again, these are retailers, but also sort of hotels, bars, and restaurants, whatnot. And then we uh, do that going forward um, at, at, a daily, uh, at a daily level, and we express the number of visits at the state level re relative to the, to the number of visits on the same day of week during the first week of, of March to, to effectively benchmark it. Okay? And then each and every single one of these thin lines in this plot is one US state. The thick line is, um, is the median at any point in time. So what you what we sort of take away from this is that around March March 10, you get this sort of remarkably uniform contraction in terms of social activity across the board in the United States prior to any um, officially mandated uh, lockdown orders. So the red line plots the fraction of the U.S. population under official uh, under official lockdown orders. And you can sort of see that much of the contraction in social activity really happens prior uh, prior to the to the lockdown, effectively on a sort of voluntary level. And I'll address some of the concerns that uh, that that might be um, might be some of them that that you might be thinking about in in, in a minute. Um, but you, you you also sort of see, and sort of starting in late April, you get you, you're starting to see a mild uh, a mild recovery, and maybe the experience across space gets a little bit more heterogeneous. All right, so 
this is another data set. This is the Google, uh, the Google data, which, which you can just freely download. Google organizes um, the data around a bunch of categories. Here we're plotting four of them, retail and recreation, which of course bonds to what I showed you, transit, workplaces, and, and also residential. And here you similarly see um, this sort of really uniform contraction across space, across all these different categories, except of course residential is, is flipped. Um, that that we've that we've seen in the in the safe graph data. Okay. Here is a uh, plot of three Nordic cities uh, along with uh, a U.S. city. So this is now at the city level. And what we're doing is we're picking Stockholm, which is sort of effectively a laissez-faire benchmark. Uh, Sweden has really been an outlier in terms of instituting very little um, official official uh, uh, lockdown orders, along with. Also in Copenhagen, it have taken very different approaches. In particular, I think Denmark has really cracked down on, on um, that's why it's in red, um, has really cracked down on, um, on mobility. And you see this, um, you, you see that, that in, in, in Stockholm, mobility contracted, but it didn't contract as much as, as in the other places. So two things. First, even in a laissez-faire laissez benchmark, people do respond to, to the infection risk. Um, but second, the lockdowns also work in the sense that in, in, in the places that have mandated uh, restrictions, you do see a, a, an even starker contraction in um, mobility. Okay, two more. Uh, now this is back to the safe graph data. Um, I'm showing you two more things. The first, the, on the left is the fraction of cell phones that leave the house at least once on, on any given day. Uh, this is just another metric, a very similar picture. Maybe, maybe in terms of the magnitude, to the extent that they're comparable. Uh, in, in terms of the magnitude, the contraction is, is somewhat smaller. Um, and this, the, on the right, uh, we plot the time uh, any given cell phone spends outside its home location. And you, you sort of see a similar, similar picture. Okay. So now, one concern uh, with this might be that, well, you, you, might, you might say, well, people might not uh, have voluntarily restricted activity, shops were just closing down, the businesses were just closing down. And so that's, that's what you're picking up there um, in, in, in the laissez fair. So we're doing one other thing to, to at least partially address that. Um, and in particular, we are sort of identifying um, uh, POI closures, so points of interest closures. Um, and so the, the equation here is our criterion. Um, the criterion is that the moment that a particular POI sees for three days in a row no more than 10% of its average daily uh, visits during the first week of March, uh, which is the benchmark week, that moment we just label um, one of these places closed. We're restricting to a, a particular set of industries, which are basically think about retailers along with like hotels and bars and, and, and whatever, cinemas. Um, and we're restricting to large POIs. By that metric, about 40, 43% of POIs have closed um, by late March. Um, and so then basically what we're doing is we're looking at traffic um, towards these, uh, these POIs um, uh, uh, before, before closure. And so this is basically plotting this. And what this is just showing is that even before the the, the business was closed, you do see sort of a very stark uh, contraction in terms of the number of, of visits. So this again, just to argue that there was something and in terms of individual behavior and an individual response you know, prior to lockdown, prior to sort of external factors um, that, that may have um, uh, reduced social activity. Okay. So we'll, we'll now I'll, I'll be setting up the model now and then later on, once I go quantitative with a model, I'll try and reconnect at least partially um, to, to this evidence. Okay, so the setup is similar in, in case you were listening in uh, to, the, to the models um, um, that were presented in the last two weeks. So I might, um, I might get, go somewhat uh, quickly. But there's basically, it's a, it's, a, it's a very basic SIRD model. Um, so um, a measure NJ population is in each of these states, which is susceptible, infected, recovered, um, and dead. Um, 
And anyone who's living hits a level of social activity, which will be denoting by little a, and they, they receive a full payoff from social activity. So utility depends on, on how active you are. And then we'll make uh, four, four assumptions. The most important one is effectively, uh, I guess these, uh, the, the second and the third one, which is that there's an interior maximum uh, to so the optimal extent of social activity, uh, which is normalized at one. Okay, so absent any infection risk, absent any disease, um, um, the individuals in our model will be picking uh, a level of social activity equal to one. If they do, um, if they pick a lower level, we'll call that social distancing. Now, here's how infections happen. Um, so from the perspective of an individual, other individuals are in these, uh, in these uh, different states. Um, these are the living ones. And they choose some, uh, some level of activity, big A, uh, which depends on their state. You get sick um, at this rate, which is beta is just some shifter. Um, little at is the, your own level of social activity. And then, um, well, you, you contact ad others of type j, depending on how many they are, and j, and how active they are, aj. And you get sick if they're infected. So if their state j is equal to, is equal to i. So now this, that, I think is, is, is um, the most common uh, modeling approach, but let me highlight that that is a quadratic matching function. It, it's not an innocuous uh, modeling decision. It matters a lot. And particularly it has, uh, it has key properties in, in that it's, it's quadratic, so it has complementarities between um, the social activities uh, of the different types. And an important feature is that um, the spread of the disease, how likely you are to get sick does not depend on the uh, activity of the recovery, okay? So how likely you are to get sick just depends on how many sick people are walking around out there, not how many healthy people are walking around out there. And that, that the EPI literature, which was focused on HIV for decades, has long used uh, a different set of assumptions um, where my infection risk also depends on uh, the, the, the social activity of the healthy people. And if you think about sort of sexually transmitted diseases where, where social contacts really get sought out and that's, that's how sort of transmission happens, that, that is a totally reasonable assumption. We think that for this particular, uh, this particular disease, um, my own infection risk is not really getting any lower if I'm flooding the street uh, with recovered people. And so that's why we're opting to go, um, to go with this technology, but it's, it's, a, it's a consequential assumption. Um, so I just want to highlight it. Okay, um, I'm gonna run through this, but just to sort of have everyone on the on the on the same page. Here's here's a little bit of terminology. Um, so the 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 illness ends at, uh, ends at uh, some rate gamma, uh, at which point you either become uh, either you pass away or you recover uh, with these two probabilities respectively. That gives you so it's a stochastic arrival rate. It gives you that the expected duration of illness is one over gamma. Um, there's, then there's what's called the basic reproduction number. Um, we, we denote this by R0. That's the expected number of others uh, a sick person will infect absent um, any sort of behavioral response, so at the interior maximum, and um, at the beginning of the, of the, of the epidemic where, where still everyone is being susceptible. Then there's the effective reproduction number, which takes into account two different things. First, the number of susceptible people um, might be falling, um, and that's going to push down how many people any sick person can get sick, and um, and social activity might be uh, might be suppressed, uh, and that itself um, affecting uh, a transmission. Now, an important sort of threshold is clearly the uh, is, is clearly one. Once the effective reproduction number uh, falls below one, uh, the the the, the stock of infected individuals uh, starts uh, starts shrinking, which is the second uh, second bullet point here. Then also just to to again uh, fix ideas, uh, herd immunity is the level is 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 a threshold for people that are still susceptible, such that even if you have everyone behave completely normally, um, uh, the disease dies out on its own. Okay, when there's just so few uh, susceptible individuals um, left. Okay, so 
I guess everyone at this point uh, is familiar with these terms. Now here's, here's how we think about uh, payoffs and the information structure. So we'll be modeling the cost of the infection as, as, as encoded in this, uh, in this variable kappa, which in principle uh, may depend on how many other individuals are sick. Um, and it, so it's a product of uh, the, um, the, the death probability uh, pi, which, which for now will allow to depend on, uh, again, the stock of um, sick individuals along with, with the value of statistical life. I'll sort of um, tell you later how we put numbers on, the, on this. There is a people discount, uh, and then there at, at some stochastic uh, arrival rate, uh, delta, a cure, uh, a cure arrives, and basically, that's, you know, the disease is over. That's by assumption. So it's not, it's not gradual. Once we have a vaccine or a cure, it's, it's over. Okay. So effectively, these two things will just be showing up as discounting. Now, in terms of the information structure, basically, the, the approach we're taking, we're using this little a, big A notation that you might notice from the neoclassical growth model, so with small k, big k uh, notation, which basically just says that, well, first, first an important other, other thing I should highlight is the sick do not know that they're sick, okay? If you're, whether you're infected or susceptible, you don't know that, and the planner doesn't know that either. So we're basically thinking of capturing the stage of the disease here where you're being asymptomatic and you're walking around, um, you, know, you might be reducing uh, your, your activity, but you don't know that you're, you're in that state. And then, so if there's a second stage of the disease where you're showing symptoms, then you go to bed and we sort of just all lumping that into, into that stage gamma where you know, either you're recovered or you, you, you pass away. Okay, and so, the equilibrium then um, imposes that little a is equal to big A, so standard uh, representative agent at notion, um, individual uh, behavior is consistent with aggregates. Okay, so here's how you can sort of get this off the ground. Uh, you write down uh, the individual problem, you choose this sort of time path for activity. There's also a time path for activity once you uh, once you recover, but that's sort of uh, that's sort of really, uh, really trivial. I should have said like, you know, once you recover, okay. So that's that's that 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 that's an assumption. Okay. Once you, what once you haven't gotten sick yet, you're in either of these two states. You pick a level of social activity that gives you a certain uh, that gives you a certain payoff, and then at this rate, um, you actually um, you become sick and you pay the cost uh, associated with sickness. And then that program is subject to the standard sort of laws of motions uh, that, 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 that come from the, uh, from the epi model. So this is literally just the SIR model uh, straight, off, uh, straight off effectively Wikipedia, except we have this sort of uh, quadratic, uh, quadratic matching technology sort of embedded here. Okay? So this is the, the number at which susceptible individuals become infected. This is the inflow into the pool of the infected, and this is the outflow individual that experiences a gamma shock. Okay. So I should have said one thing. Let me scroll back um, because I sort of skipped over this assumption. So here in this, when I've been talking about the quadratic matching technology, I've been highlighting that effectively what the recoveries do here doesn't matter for the course of the disease. Okay, it's only the, the, the behavior of the infected. For that reason, what I can effectively do from here on is I can sort of entirely ignore uh, that part of the, um, of the population. I can also ignore the distinction between the recovered and the dead. Okay. Now, of course, there's matters for cost calculations, but for, for the dynamics of the disease, for the dynamics of optimal policy, um, I, I can ignore that. Okay. So that's, that's what I'll be doing. Okay. So equilibrium is, is completely standard. Uh, uh, individual behavior is optimal, and then uh, 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 and, and also consistent with with aggregates. Okay. So how do you set this up? You just like write down uh, you write down the the, the the current value of Hamiltonian, and then you sort of apply the cookbook you learn in, 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 in first year macro. So you get a static first order uh, first order condition for 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 optimality that effectively balances the uh, the returns from um, the utility returns from uh, activity with uh, the, the, the pain associated with, uh, with, getting, with getting sick, uh, the risk 
and, and the risk. And then, then you effectively get uh, the, these two co-state equations, which are ODEs that encode the, the values of being in need of state, the value of being sick, or the value of being infected. And so that gives you a system of ODEs, uh, five ODEs. The first two here are, are the standard SIR um, epi, epi, the standard SIR epi model. Um, so it's four ODEs. The other two are the co-state equations that um, govern the, the evolution of uh, the, the shadow cost of, of being in either state. And then there's a static uh, first order, uh, first order condition. So the entire model really collapses into, into this, uh, this very, very simple and, and easily solvable set, um, set of equations. Okay. So um, I should push ahead. Uh, so this is, now I'm going to talk about optimal policy. And so if the, the main takeaway is that it really collapses into effectively a symmetric system of equations that just differs along some very uh, sort of minor dimensions. So you write down uh, the, the problem for the social planner, which just directly uh, uh, chooses um, social activity, the average social activity. Um, and then you get a system of equations, which is, again, the two epi, it's exactly the same to um, uh, 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 equations on the epi model, a static of uh, first order optimality condition that's exactly the same except the planner recognizes uh, the quadratic nature of uh, the matching technology that's the two here. And then these two co-state equations which are exa again exactly symmetric except for two additional terms which is that the planner recognizes that individual behavior does not internalize that if you're getting sick, you pu you're putting others at risk. That's exactly encoded in this block here. And, 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 and that's sort of the first important externality. And then there's a second important externality, which is what people sometimes call the SU constraint, which is that in principle, you know, as, as you're getting sick, you're, you're putting pressure on the hospital system and that may, may affect uh, the survival chances of, of other sick individuals. Yeah. So that these are sort of, but, but otherwise it's exactly the same set of equations and so, so it's very easy to, to code it up. It's very transparent to see sort of where the, the reason for policy intervention arises from. Okay, so now I'm basically putting numbers on this. Um, so this is, a, this is just the interest rate. Um, so it's just discounting, uh, that's easy. Um, here we're assuming that at the expected arrival rate until uh, a cure arrives is a year and a half. Um, here, I assume that you're sick for seven days on average. That sounds short, but keep in mind that we just want to sort of isolate the part of the disease where you're asymptomatic and you're walking around getting others sick. Um, so that's why I went with seven here. And then you basically, uh, you can, you can uh, 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 fix beta here from this equation, which is just a, from, the, from the first flow, uh, a flow equation for the stock of infected. And we're targeting a 30% uh, growth rate of that stock uh, in, 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 in the baseline where, uh, where, where things are um, uncurtailed. And so this gives you um, a basic reproduction number of 3.1 okay, at, the, at the outset. And we're starting out um, with a situation where, uh, where, one, out of, um, where one, one out of 300 Americans is, so basically I'll be talking about the US in, in terms of the calibration, uh, is, is sick. Sorry, one out of a million. Okay, so the part that's a bit trickier is um, how you pick a, a value of statistical life. Um, so what we'll be doing is, um, as I've mentioned, the kappa encodes both the, the, the risk of death and the value of statistical life. Well, effectively, I, I won't be able to sort of, given in the interest of time, I, I, I can't really talk you through the details, but effectively, what you target is, you know, you ask people, and people have done this out there in the data, and what's the fraction of um, your uh, consumption that you're willing to forego to avoid a certain uh, percentage chance of, uh, of, of passing away? I give you a number, and that's a number I can sort of, I can ask the same question to the agents in my model, and, and target uh, and target that number. So that's basically how you proceed, and that uh, that allows you to, to put a number on this V here. We're picking a, a 0.2 uh, case, uh, uh, case fatality rate, 
So that's sort of on the low end. Um, at the same time, we're picking a value of statistical life equal to, to 10 million in, um, in the data. So that's, that's maybe on the high end. Anyway, this gives us this cover. We're doing a bunch of, uh, a bunch of robustness with, uh, with respect to it. Okay, so, um, so here are basically um, our, our uh, most important results. So I'll, I'll be given that so I have 10 minutes, so I'll be going um, going a bit uh, a bit more slowly. So this is this is uh, just to start with. This is the equilibrium, and then then I'll be uh, contrasting it with um, with the optimal with the optimal path. So what you can see here is several things. First, if you sort of look at social activity. And um, what we can sort of see is that at the onset, when, and this is sort of uh, say 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 early March, people do not restrict uh, social activity. So the 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 interceptor is effectively at the interior optimum. Why is that? Because at the onset, the infection risk is just really small. There's just very few infected individuals around, and before infection risk is high, people just just won't sort of pull back, uh, rationally pull back. Uh, uh, individual behavior. Okay, so you can see uh, social activity effectively always just uh, just mimics the the, uh, the evolution of the stock of the infected and is lowest when you effectively getting to uh, to to peak infection. Okay, and so another thing is I don't want to make too much out of these quantities, but you get a fairly rapid, despite not as rapid as in the data, but a fairly rapid uh, contraction. Of social activity to some some sorry to, to sorry I should be talking about this here to some to some sixty percent and it's yeah it's it's uh, it's um, it's not as fast as in the data but it's sort of broadly if you sort of think about the figures I've shown you initially so sort of that looks a bit similar to say say what I've shown you for for the U.S. or uh, or for Sweden now one one pervasive feature and I'll be talking about this sort of after after the planner a bunch more. Is that in in this less fair setting, what happens is that effectively this contraction in social activity brings down the basic reproduction number and it's mechanically obviously crossing one at peak infection. Then what's what's basically happening is not overshooting match, and it's sort of immediately sort of the one has has a lot of gravity here and it just sort of stays at the one sort of un until you're basically getting to, to herd immunity. So in this less fair benchmark, what's happening is Activity is such that you get to peak, and then it sort of gradually adjusts in a fashion that just keeps uh, keeps the stock of inf inf infected rolling over and only very gradually uh, declining. Now, one other thing I should mention is we haven't really targeted at some lesser fair case. What you could do, what we find sort of a promising alternative to the calibration um, strategy we've been using and, and most others have been using is to really sort of target say the Swedish experience and let behavior we, we're doing this a lot in, in econ but let the, the behavior of say the individuals in Stockholm or, or Sweden reveal um, the um, the associated the, 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 yeah, sort of the risk um, and, and and the associated cost uh, uh, of, of infection perceived by uh, by, by individuals yeah? that's, that's just uh, to mention that Okay, so here's um, here's that blue is exactly the same stuff I, I, I just talked you through. It's exactly the same plot. The red is is um, is is the optimal uh, is the optimal path. Okay, so let me sort of start out with with uh, with this this one here, social activity. So the first key observation is that uh, I mentioned individual behavior is not immediately responding again because uh, in fact that the stock of infections is so low. The social planner, however, immediately, quite sharply, uh, effectively imposes mandatory social distancing, um, really reduces, uh, reduces social activity. Why is that? It's effectively because the social planner recognizes that doing so really just sort of pushes back, uh, pushes back the outbreak and effectively buys time, um, buys time for you know, society to, to effectively uh, um, find a vaccine. Okay, so, so that's sort of the first, um, the first uh, uh, observation. It's, it's fairly, it's fairly effective. So, so, so it's really like if you look at sort of the first, you know, the first half year, the only difference here is in the first couple of months, but that really allows the planner to, to massively delay a full outbreak 
uh, relative to what's happening on, in the in the uncurtailed um, in, in in the laissez-faire setting. I should say, of course, all these plots are conditional on that sort of uh, on us not having been lucky in terms of the search for a vaccine. The moment the vaccine arises, it's over. Okay, but so, so th these are just uh, conditional. Uh, these are just conditional paths. Now. Another important observation, however, and, and I'll try and give you some, uh, some intuition for this on the, on the next few slides, is that uh, social activity relative to that's a fair is, is suppressed for, for really a long, a long, a long time. Okay? So this is basically going out for two years. So this is basically just saying under the optimal path, if we're not lucky with a vaccine, social activity will stay, uh, will still, uh, will stay repressed for long. However, and that sort of again, this sort of ties back to what I've mentioned initially. It does so in a in a somewhat mild fashion, in a particular sense. So, if you look at the path, the uh, the, base, the effective reproduction number takes under uh, under the optimal policy, effectively gradually takes it down to one. Again, it crosses one exactly at the. But then the planner here is not wiping things out. It's not, it's not driving things down to, to zero and sort of pursuing a, a New Zealand style policy. Instead, what the planner does is at this low level of infection, it's just sort of sort of gradually, uh, gradually rolling things over, um, effectively for one uh, individual leaving the hospital, another one walks in, and that sort of takes you on a very slow path. Uh, if you look, look up here, on a very slow path, uh, towards uh, towards herd immunity, which again will take will take effectively many years, if not decades, again in, in, a, in a conditional sense, if if we don't if we don't manage to find find a vaccine. So what I'll what I'll sort of uh, try and, and use uh, the next most of my remaining time is, is to give you a little bit of uh, of intuition for for why we get these why we get these features because like these are really sort of very robust uh, features that we find sort of across a broad range of, of, of calibration choices. So just to, to, to start with, but broadly speaking, the plan of you can take two routes, conditional on, not, uh, on, on having found no vaccine. It could be a path towards permanent suppression that really trying to drive down uh, the, um, the uh, re uh, reproduction rate down to zero or a path towards uh, herd immunity. So now suppose for, for a moment you were suppressing social activity, um, social activity is susceptible and infected in a permanent, uh, in a permanent fashion. What you can then basically see is that there's a bit of a sort of like a deviation argument that, that sort of um, shows that that policy can't quite be right. What you can show is like if you do that, eventually um, the stock of infected gets, I mean, the, the disease is still going to be lurking. But the stock of the remaining infected are very, very few. Um, so of course, there's an assumption here, which is that in our setting, given our assumption, the disease can never fully be uh, can never fully be eradicated. Now, what you get if you get to sort of a point far enough out in time is that if you uh, increase um, social activity for a short time, you still have susceptible people around. So you get sort of first order benefits from that deviation. But if that sort of remaining, at the remaining stock of uh, infected is small enough, then effectively the cost of that deviation are so far in the future that you know, the deviation has to be beneficial. So this just gives some intuition for why sort of a very, very long run path towards permanent suppression can't quite be, uh, can't quite be optimal. Okay, so now let me give, make sort of an attempt in, in terms of explaining why, um, why you, we get this feature in both equilibrium and, and under the optimum that so the, the uh, basic, uh, the effective reproduction number stays anchored so, so close to one after, after P. So what's going on is if you think about what's governing uh, the basic, uh, the effective reproduction number is effectively the two state variables, how many uh, susceptible infected are around and behavior. But behavior, of course, just again, depends on the two state variables. So now let's ask what happens to the, the evolution of these two uh, state variables. This, this one here is the stock of susceptible that's moving very slowly. That's, that's basically in most Western countries that's maybe fallen from 100% to 99%, but that has really just hardly, hardly moved at all. So now what happens at peak infection? Well, the stock of infected by definition is not moving at all because that's a definition of peak infections. 
Okay, so you're basically at a point where the states are hardly moving. But if the states are hardly moving, behavior is hardly moving. And so you can sort of see how, how that has sort of a very, very strong pull and you really sort of, you know, both under the, under the, the, the equilibrium path, but also under optimal policy, you're sort of really not changing things much. And you're not, you're not sort of strongly um, undershooting that, that, that one. Okay. Now let's think about the long run. What's happening in the long run, we can actually prove this, the disease dies out. So you have, you have a very, you have a very uh, small stock of infected left. So, but then again, the two state variables are hardly moving. So behavior shouldn't be really changing much. But if, if, if these things are all true, then our E effectively, you, you, have, you have sort of a notion of a steady state where just like one person, uh, anyway, um, our E is very, uh, it, it, it stays very close. So that, that's sort of my, my attempt at giving some, some intuition. Uh, the state is hardly evolved, then behavior hardly evolved. So that sort of anchors things after the peak, so very close to, to one. Now, the reason things are so persistent is of course, the peak is fairly low, in particular, um, if the disease is, is um, what well, the peak is fairly low. So then that kind of policy effectively takes you at a very, very slow track towards, towards herd immunity. So again, conditional on not having found a, a vaccine, it's a very, uh, it results in a very persistent suppression of activities. Okay, so I'm basically almost out of time. So basically, we, we've done a lot of robustness. So we changed the utility function. Just look at the top. As we changed the utility function. We doubled the cost of infections. We, um, we almost tripled the duration of the disease. We, we moved around the probability of the cure. Um, we started with a much higher level of initial, uh, initially infected individuals. The important thing is that if you sort of just look at the bottom right, um, the evolution of the optimal reproduction number, it just doesn't move so much. It pre pretty quickly gets down to, uh, to peak infections. I mean, just sort of, I don't know whether that's very useful, but, but anyway, so that, that feature is really, is really quite, uh, quite pervasive. Um, there is, of course, still, still sort of strong differences in terms of the optimal uh, course of the disease. So if it gets very costly, you know, the, the planning policy becomes even more prolonged um, and, and, and you know, infections get suppressed further. Um, if, it, if, it, if suppression is extremely costly because uh, duration becomes long, uh, the planner lets it, lets it grow much more quickly. So there is important differences, but um, you know, so if at least this, this, this particular feature here that we've been highlighting and the initial suppression feature, uh, that's really, uh, that's really uh, uh, quite robust. Okay, so I'll conclude with this. Um, we think that the equilibrium we have can connect uh, even quantitatively with uh, the less fair type uh, responses that we that we demonstrate and show in the data. Um, and then we have highlighted these, these three features here um, of optimal policy, which is that, again, it cracks down um, right away. It's fairly persistent if, if, if we're not lucky with, uh, with a sort of medical progress. But then at the same time, it is, it is very moderate and it's not an attempt to sort of completely wipe out the disease, but rather gets to a low, low peak. And from then on, just sort of slowly, uh, slowly rolls over. So allows uh, social activity to sort of rebound to an extent where it just sort of, uh, we're not letting it explode again, but we're just sort of rolling, rolling over slowly. Now, let me just sort of conclude by, of course, highlighting that the policy that we've been studying here is an extremely blunt and costly tool. Right, so the, the planner you cannot uh, uh, do anything particularly sur surgical or sophisticated, but unfortunately, I think that sort of pretty much picks up uh, the, the policy response we've been seeing seeing uh, seeing across the globe so far. Um, so hopefully, uh, um, we'll, we'll we'll soon have um, other tools available. Um, so I'll I'll leave it I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Greg. So uh, if you have a question, please use the Q&A. There is already one question. I, I wanted to ask a question before I think you answered at the end. Right. And my question was for, uh, so the role of the second externality, that's, that's Kappa, right? And, right. And, and you show that it doesn't matter much, right? Yeah, so, so it's an important externality. What I'm doing here, I should have highlighted this. Um, what I'm doing here is I'm basically just setting it to a constant number here. 
So this is where I'm effectively just for the for the quantitative purposes just completely ignoring um, the to say the ICU constraint or something like that. We think that basically the, this rollover feature would really would really um, not be affected by that. I think I think basically what what you might get is that the the, the peak, peak infections would be would be lower in, in case you get into sort of the constraint region for sure. Um, but but because of the, the features we are highlighting, we think uh, sort of arise even in the absence, uh, even in the absence of that constraint, which is sort of why we opted to, um, to, to, to go with that. But in principle, the, the setup here totally allows, you, know, you just have this additional term, it totally allows for, um, and, um, you know, to, to take that into account, to, to play with that. Okay, good. So we have a question um, by Helen uh, Turon. Uh, with about um, the role of population density. So what, mm. what, what does, so, so the question is like, it's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's an urban area different from a rural area. It's Sweden different from Italy because of density. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know into, about sort of the facts, uh, the facts and what, to, to the, what, what the, the epi knowledge about this is. But what I'll say is that we have a we have sort of a very natural way to uh, to to um, take that into account and to sort of explore that at least inside a model because you know you can, you can sort of change the the increasing returns uh, to scale in the in the in the sort of uh, transmission function. So effectively here we sort of implicitly normalize that at, at quadratic, but but you know, maybe in some places, um, maybe in some more rural places, you have you have you have a sort of a more linear uh, technology, less explosive technology, and maybe maybe in urban setting, it's 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 um, it's more curved. Okay. What I know, what I know is that this is sort of having sort of talked a little bit with uh, epidemiologists, is that these guys are way ahead of economists in terms of integrating these type of features into their models. So they have like absolutely massive models that they run on supercomputers that really allow, they're, they're very localized, they allow for all sorts of bells and whistles. And I, that's sort of, I mean, this might sound a little pedagogical, but, but from my viewpoint, we have relatively little to, to add as economists in terms of sort of enriching our models with these type of sort of features of, of reality. They're obviously important, but I think they, they really got that part covered. What we can really sort of bring to the table is, is sort of models of endogenous behavior and sort of integrating cost benefit uh, with, the, with the epi models and, and sort of um, you know, the, the ways we've been doing for, for a long time. So there is a question and we see what is the I thought is so the question is that uh, if you if you have a way to constantly, if I understand the question correctly, constantly validating your model, or just you started with some bunch of hypotheses and you stuck to it. If I understand the question correctly. So. I, yeah, I, I'm not sure I can see it myself, but but basically, in terms of validation, and it's not it's not easy, but but we do think that the type of Swedish data that we were looking at, the type of U.S. data pre-lockdown, is useful in terms of informing our models and even sort of the quantitative properties of the model. In some sense, we think that that's why it's neat to have both equilibrium and optimal policy in this sort of very tightly integrated uh, framework because you can then use the equilibrium part of the model to connect with the data to partially inform the parameters and then sort of the optimal policy, uh, the optimal policy part to then infer, uh, think about the implied uh, path for, uh, uh, for optimal policy. And so I do think that, you know, it's not a perfect fit, but but we have seen uh, in the data that you know, social activity contracts by some fifty percent, and it does so over 
over say 20 days in 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 March, and then you know if, again this is not perfect, but you know you contract by uh, uh, by some 40 percent in some in, in some 30 days. Of course, I think we're at the beginning of exploring these models, but at least it's not it's not you know to, to first order. I think that picks up picks up what's happening in the data. Then of course, you know we have to see what's how Sweden is going to look like. I, for instance, I doubt that that the disease is going to uh, going to evolve that rapidly uh, in, 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 in Sweden. It, 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 I don't think it, it's, it's taking such a steep path. So then, you know, maybe you have to uh, you have to make some some adjustments. Uh, but but I do think there's enough data out there for us to discipline this model. Um, um, so there is a question from Jonathan Dengel. Uh, this is a representative agent model. Uh, recent events have drawn to, uh, the attention to the role of super spreaders. Mm -hmm. uh, so what would the heterogeneous agent version of the model tell us? So, so it's true that, that heterogeneity is, um, is, is a really important feature of this disease. Um, I think one aspect that we've been maybe maybe we were somewhat surprised that comes out of this once we start working with a um, heterogeneous agent version of this is that effectively you if you really think there's super spreaders out there which are individuals what you effectively want is you want you want to encourage them to go out and get get sick i mean to the extent like you know, if, if there's lots of young people out there that are that have a fairly low risk of infections and that you know assuming that once, once you uh, become immune uh, you're good um, you do want to actually encourage uh, lots of social activity uh, uh, for that group because then once once they get past the disease of course that protects those that are uh, that are that are vulnerable um, so that that sort of to me, in terms of thinking about cost benefits and externalities, that's sort of the, the maybe may, may maybe a key insight. By the way, let me advertise that Jonathan, who just asked this question, will be presenting next week that's right. his paper on uh, who can work from home. Um, so, so one question I had, but then I I, I forgot the question. Okay, so, yes. So, if I um, if I look at your profile of the, you know, of the equilibrium of the social optimum, uh, so it seems that they, and I compare them with the data, and I, you know, I assume that you know, uh, Sweden is equilibrium, and you know, some other countries a social planner. Right. So, so the key difference in, in, in your model, what the key difference is really at the beginning, right? The first ten days or. Yeah, so I, this is probably like more like a month or something, but that's right. Like a month. That's right. In the data, it's more the 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 amplitude, right? So social distancing starts about the same time. The key difference is that it's deeper in the social planner, let's say. Yeah. Yeah. So so my excuse, I I, I guess I do want to take the stance that partially say say the equilibrium modeling here is is connected with um with say the swedish experience or the pre-lockdown uh experience elsewhere i'm not sure i want to take the stance yet that you know uh policy makers in particular given how this sort of happened um and how rushed and ad hoc everything was really came close in terms of you know sort of implementing sort of the, this optimal path through 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 the lens of the model so but they were I, late already. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it might well be they were late. Um, it might well be they, they, you know, they didn't quite you know, know what, what optimal policy looks like. Um, so, so that's that's how you could um, maybe reconcile it. But, but I agree that that you know, if I clearly, if I if I sort of bring up my 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 Stockholm versus Oslo. Uh, picture that doesn't look so much like this. It looks like a, a similar path, but then um, you get a, a much steeper drop in 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 um, in, uh, in in activity in 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 also. So that's 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 a fair comment. 
the really striking feature of the model is this fact that the you know the, the planner would set this very high this very high R with respect to what we think it would be optimal, right? Well, so, so yeah, I guess at this point I've convinced myself that this might well make sense to be uh, to be optimal, but I, I agree that to us it was to an extent somewhat somewhat surprising when 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 we first uh, when we for, first observed this. Again, I do think uh, I do think it. It, it makes it makes sense, right? So that the planner sets a certain amount of social activity, uh, you know, given given that the state is say here and here. Well, the states hardly move. Um, so why should the planner change uh, change social activity? Is it sort of like a very slow moving system? And uh, effectively, the definition of a slow moving system is that it just rolls over. Uh, it just rolls over uh, uh, the stock of uh, in, in infected individuals. So, so on some level, I think. It's natural, but it's, I, I agree that it's something that maybe other papers haven't, um, haven't uh, highlighted as, uh, as much. So I don't see any more questions. We have online also your co-author, Mariam. I don't know if she wants to say something, if uh, we have any more questions, comments. Mariam is here. <laughs> I don't know if Mariam, you have uh, anything to add? I just want to say thanks, Gregor. I think it was great, and I think I'm, I think I agree with Gregor that this issue of heterogeneity is very interesting, especially if you think there are agents who are super spreaders and they had very low cost versus people. Who, I mean, maybe think about younger people and then people who are older and more uh, immunocompromised. And then uh, what planner would want to do might, wanna, might be that he wants to set the super spreaders out so that others can benefit from this, everybody reaching herd immunity. But that's something that we have discussed, but maybe we can think about that more precisely in the paper, but it's very interesting. Okay. I... No more questions? No taker? Well, if, uh, if we, we don't have any more questions, we do something that rarely happens. We end up a bit early. <laughs> uh, so thanks a lot, uh, Greg and, uh, and Mariam. Uh, so we'll have another seminar uh, next week. We'll have a seminar every week until uh, basically the end of July. And we'll have Jonathan Lingle uh, from Chicago um, and uh, he'll be talking by how many uh, jobs can be done from, from home. And uh, thanks a lot uh, to everybody, to Mariolina from CPR side for organizing this. And uh, cool. see you next week. Thanks a lot. Thank Bye, you. Bye, guys.